Hello and welcome to the final part of the Talk Toys wrap up of 2020. It's been a wild ride so far. We've discussed games, movies, music. That's it. That's we just discussed those. But today we have one or two more topics to go through uh, to cover, you know, sort of highlights and lowlights maybe of 2020. Um, and as with the last two parts, I have three guests with me today. I have Tim. Hello. I have Dan. Hello. And I have Tom. Hey, yo. Hey, there hey, you are. And West, shout out to the West Country viewers out there. I'm sure there's lots of you. Um, yeah. So let's pick up as we did uh, with part two. No reason for a preamble. Let's dive straight in to the next category. And that is the best thing you read in 2020. Um, so much with the much as with the film and movie category and the music thing. This doesn't. This isn't really something you read that was made or published in 2020. It's just the best thing you read all year. Because um, I don't know about you guys, but being uh, inside the house slightly more often than average due to an unspecified event, I've I found myself with a little bit of extra time to read, and I, I read quite a bit this year. Uh, so I'll start with my nomination first, and um, proper out of left field, and a book I'm sure no one has mentioned this year so far. And that is the book Endangered Species by Richard Woodman. Uh, so a very brief summary, and I don't think this is going to sell it to anyone listening here, uh, but Endangered Species is about the decline of the merchant navy, basically, and um, some people on a sort of uh, cargo ship... Uh, sailing to, I think it's China, that uh, are basically caught in a storm and come across a sort of a boat that's capsizing in the same storm. And uh, yeah, it kind of goes from there. Basically, it's kind of like the perfect storm, but in book form. And uh, I don't know, it was, it was just really interesting. It sort of caught me off guard. It, it's a book I picked up like 12 years ago, I think, or something. Uh, I think it was given to me, actually, when I did work experience at a local library. And uh, yeah, I decided to give it a read, and it turned out it was really engaging. Actually, I've never thought of reading anything relating to like sailing and the sea and stuff before, but that was pretty cool. If if you guys are interested in boats and stuff, maybe maybe give it a go. So perspective is it read? Like, where where's the perspective in the book? Like, what um, character? If, They're pro ag against endangered species. Uh, so, well, the in endangered species obviously is a play on the fact that the Merchant Navy and stuff are kind of... I think it's set in, like, the late 80s, early 90s, I think, when uh, mm. when it's sort of... But, yeah, um, the, so the, there's two different perspectives. One is of the captain of the ship and one is of one of the crewmates. Um, it kind of follows both of them. And, like... It it's got it's got your average drama of kind of like you know the captain's an old grizzled man and sort of the some of the crewmates are like, uh you know one one's a kind of well to do middle class man one's a sort of like, quite poor but rough like scouser person and, you know there's it's got all the like clashes you'd expect but honestly it's mm. it's really interesting because it just goes into depth I'd never thought of and sort of just. You know, it it made it made ships kind of, kind of interesting. I thought for a moment, um, I thought it was like a uh, like like a non fiction documentary kind of book. But you'd think so, yeah. The the name is very uh, off, well, not off putting, but it, it's very it would throw you for a loop. Like if you were to ask for it in a bookshop, you wouldn't expect to see like a capsizing ship on the front of it, really. But yeah, <laughs> it was it was, uh, it, it was a pretty darn good read. I was impressed. All right, uh, so who would like to go next? Yeah, I'll go next. All right. Um, so I went in, t first of all, I'm going to say I broke your rule a little okay. bit. <laughs> Didn't read it. It's an audio book. Ah, that's fine. We'll accept it. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah I, think, you... I think I could count that because I am, I'll be honest, I haven't really read anything this year. Uh, listened to a couple of audio books, but. I went into this audiobook actually, um, just looking for law, really. Uh, but I actually went in, got into it, and it's actually a great story. So, funnily enough, uh, my choice of the year is 
Halo Contact Harvest, which is oh. kind of... It's not chronolo chronologically the first book in, like, the lore, because there's, like, pre-human lore and stuff like that. But it is, like, the first book kind of setting up the conflict between humanity and the Covenant. Uh, ah. If any of... If anyone's, like, kind of cured of Halo or played a bit of it. Mm. So the perspectives, it has a couple of perspectives which I found quite interesting. Okay. Um, so the kind of perspective it starts on is uh, Sergeant Johnson, who's from the games. They build up his character a bit, give him a bit of backstory. It was really quite interesting. Um, there's no, oh, like... Cool. Yeah, at this point, well, in this book, there aren't any Spartans at all, so oh. it's it's interesting because the book starts outside of the war. Uh, it's before the war, and it details oh, so it's like the a first... prequel. Yeah, yeah. So it's a pre. It's definitely a prequel to hmm. all the games so far. Um, I really like what it did. So it talks about Sergeant Johnson. Um, and he's brought to Harvest, which is the planet it's based on, to, um, well, train militia against, um, like, insurgents, because there's, like, loads of insurgents against the government at this point. But really, his secret role is to, like, kind of look into these alien invaders, They've started to appear. Um, it also goes into the perspective of the Covenant. Uh, various different characters. There's um, a grunt. A, um, and the grunt's kind of... He's he's this guy uh, who actually wants peace. Uh, which is quite interesting. Hmm. It's quite an interesting perspective. And he's actually trying to make peace with the humans. And it also goes into the political machinations of the prophets. And there are it go the perspective is from one prophet who happens to be one of the prophets in the games, who basically leads the war. Uh so it, it's really interesting. It really got me by surprise. Does it um, like um like for would it hold up for someone who wasn't honestly i think it would definitely and as a prequel you can kind of understand it better what's interesting is i was i was kind of expected it to like be a sudden invasion in the book but it doesn't happen like that mm. and it um kind of explores like a first contact scenario with aliens that's really cool yeah, so it's quite interesting. I wasn't expecting it, to be honest. Mm. It's quite a story, and obviously it, like, sets up towards the other things. But, uh, yeah, overall, very good book. I'd recommend it to anyone, uh, especially if they kind of want to get into Halo a bit. Um, yeah. I don't think you need to understand too much. Like, I don't even know if you have to have played the games beforehand, really, to get it. Yeah, I, I, I guess it helps, especially when you want to visualize, like all the covenant and stuff like that, what they look like. Mm. But, I think it's uh, it's highly recommend. It sounds like it's one of those things that you could go into it new, but if you understand the series and stuff, it's probably quite um, it's it's mm. got we're well, not fan service, but you know what I mean. It's, it's got nods and yeah. things that fans could pick yeah. up on. I did Definitely, not know Halo I mean... was that deep. I thought it was just. Alien shit. Oh, yeah. there's tons of books. There, hmm. and to be honest, I'm gonna go into them a bit more. I'm, I'm not mega fond on the really prequel prequels, which are yeah. like pre-human and stuff because that's to do with like the new games. They're not so interesting. But like, yeah, I definitely am gonna read more. Hmm. And the books ahead are actually still prequels to all of ah. the games. That's cool. Um, so there's like a lot of them leading up to the situations of the games. But anyway, I'll I'll stop on that now. Nice. Well, look forward to the uh, Halo book 
uh, reviews for uh, the Talk Toys 2021 uh, retrospective in uh, 11 months and 20 days time or wherever. Uh, yeah, thanks, Tom. I genuinely, that, that was quite enlightening because I'd seen the books on the shelves and ne- I, I I just never bothered to even think of what they'd have covered. So, pretty cool. Uh, right, who would like to nominate their reedy thing next? I'll go. Okay. So, I read uh, a couple of books uh, this year. I read um, uh, I read a book about uh, cannibalism. Um, and that's the thing. It, it's kind of weird. Like, like I know it's it is like kind of like <gasps> quite quite shocking. But when I read the book, it was actually very thoroughly researched, and that was by Bill Shutt. I think I, that's his name. It's like S C H U T T. Okay. But no, that is not my novel of the year. My novel uh, of the year is Dune. Nice. Ah. I put it off for, for ages because uh, I've tried reading it a few times and like the first hundred pages are quite quite tough and heavy. But uh, after I was like I was determined to do this, and uh, after I after the hundred pages and uh, well it just uh, the whole book flew by and i finished it and i was like yo that was an experience so um you know for those uh, in you know might know dune like it was a film it was adapted into a film by uh, david lynch um mm-hmm. um it was a bit of a considered a flop but it was kind of like a cult film and now uh dennis uh villain knew Villeneuve? Villeneuve? He did the. He yeah, did the, I, I uh, don't know how to pronounce his last Blade, name. Yeah. <laughs> Vill, Villeneuve? 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 I, I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, he did the um, sequel to Blade Runner, um, which is uh, like Red, one of Red's favorite yes. films ever. Um, uh, but no, I. Uh, Dune, right? Here. So it, if, if you don't know what Dune is, it's like a. One of the big world building novels uh it's like so it's like an ecological novel about this um uh pl- uh desert planet and uh the, the the resources on that planet are limited so water and spice and these are a big these are like the big components that drive the story um but like the there's so there's so many layers to this book like um but one of the big themes is not everything is what it seems and uh her frank herbert does a great job of this so like so his kind of thing is that you know to be wary of charismatic leaders or leaders that encourage people's desires and vices or or even leaders that use religion as a as a as a tool uh, and it's it, it, again. It's it's one of those things you got you got to read through it, and then you're just like, oh my god, it's so uh, it's really rewarding. That's one of the cool things. It's right up there with like, uh, uh, Tolkien when yeah, it comes to I, like. World I've heard, and... yeah, I've heard the like the world of Dune because I know there's there's a series, isn't there? There's there's a few books in the Dune mm. series. Um, but like even the language. Oh, go on, go on. But yeah, but I, I, I've always seen it as you said, put uh in comparison to like Tolkien and other strong world building things, and that like it takes its time to get going, but you get a sense of the world. I, I've not read it myself, but oh, like honestly, and then it, it it puts a lot of sci-fi novels to to shame hmm. because uh not that I'm saying they're all, but there's some cracking ones out there, but. Uh, like even like everything feels authentic like down to the language so and what I know like because I after reading I did like a little bit of research um, and I found like he he'd actually used real uh, terms so like uh, Kwisatz Haderach uh, is actually ancient Hebrew for oh. shortening of the way um the Bene Gesserit are like these, um, like this uh, 
kind of cult and that is latin for well governed and oh, that's cool. and um there's a there's a mouse on the planet which uh, one of the characters uses as a as a nickname uh mm. called uh, muaddib and that is arabic for teacher ah oh. and it's like it's uh, again a lot of layers like the the guy really like it took him years to make the book apparently and he he just put a ton of effort and it's like um also one of the best books i've ever read not even just of 2020 hmm. um like of all time so nice I'm, that is quite I'm, high praise yeah I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic for the film uh coming up whenever that film is coming up but uh yeah we shall see yeah absolutely yeah um, I, i'll i'll probably uh end up reading it before the movie comes out as well i mm. think just because i'm curious yeah I, yeah i'm quite intrigued as well yeah i kind of want to dive into it as well uh, weirdly actually my first encounter with dune was that uh playstation one real-time strategy game oh, oh god yeah. yeah they did do that didn't they really it was hard as nails <laughs> yeah it was it was a weird like project i i think it was part of a multimedia plan they had for dune as in i think there was like pretty sure there's like a tv pl show planned and some other things and mm. i think a lot of things were scrapped but the game was like well we've made a game now just release it anyway well so, it's a oh. good game if you guys ever want to go back and play a really hard strategy game Hmm. Yeah, I'm looking at it. It looks like uh, Command and Conquer. But See like your main game. tune. Ah. Is it? Yeah, ah, yeah they why. made the game as well. Uh, the people who made Command and Conquer. It plays pretty much the same as it, uh, except the AI is just the hardest possible thing on the planet. Powered ah. by supercomputers, I swear. <laughs> nice. Well, thank you, Daniel. Uh, so I believe that leaves the last book nomination to you, Tim. Oh, well, yeah. reading nomination then. Well, my favourite thing that I read, I've only started re reading recently, and I don't want to talk too much about it because um, it'll, it's a hard one to describe. It's very different from everyone else's um, uh, nominations. But what I want to do instead is just read you a small excerpt, first of all. Okay. So prepare yourselves. <clears throat> Meeting people can be a very daunting proposition, not only for the antisocial or agoraphobic, for everyday horses and kitties like you, my friend. Here are some ways to expand your social horizons. Cold calling. Pick up the phone, dial a random number, see what happens. I like to do this when I'm bored and to practice my acting skills, and I found that if you lead with, there's been a terrible accident, they tend to stay on the line. Crying in a public place like a park or a skating rink is a good way to attract new people into your life. If you're in a well-ventilated area outside, you can also nonchalantly light something on fire. Perhaps your gloved hand. A little bit of drama goes a long way. Bookstores are great places to meet people. When you spot someone who looks intriguing, ask, ask them for the current date and time, and use that as a jumping off point. My number one tip for meeting new friends requires you to have a pretty significant drug or alcohol problem, or perhaps a serious food or sex addiction. Figure out which one you've got, and then find a list of all the 12 step meetings in your area and voila you've now got free unfettered access to a whole bunch of new people who are just dying to get to know you nice thank you i hope you all enjoyed my excerpt from trixie and well. Cassie's guide to modern womanhood well there we are that is <laughs> nice and i hope you've all learned something as well educational yeah i i mean i i feel that summarizes the entire book i i feel like any any further depth or uh <laughs> or sort of lead up may uh may you know sort of it's full of very interesting tidbits like that and very um genuinely helpful ways to live your life wow honestly tim i'm curious how uh how you discovered this book though well it's from Two of my favourite drug queens, Trixie Mattel and Katia Tamological. Oh, okay. ah, With a Christmas okay. present that I have been reading um a lot. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I uh, that that is definitely, as you said, uh sort of like, oh, unlikely to be similar to the rest of them. It's like, yeah, maybe. I yeah. 
I feel like uh, left field is a bit of an understatement there. <laughs> well, I should point out, actually, in the last chapter, they do go into some Halo lore, so ah, I'm not entirely yeah. sure. Oh, yeah. And the, there's, that, there's that chapter midway about um, how to survive on a desert planet. And there's, <laughs> the, there's the addendum of surviving on a ship during the uh, decline of the Merchant Navy. So, I mean, it's kind of linked, but, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it brings it all together, really. <laughs> exactly. Right, well, there we are. That that was a, that was an interesting host of things to read, and hopefully those listening at home, maybe uh, if you felt the urge to read something or listen to an audio book or something, maybe that's uh, given you a bit of an inspiration for one, you know, for something to pick up. I like how you said the urge to read. Like I just reminded of somewhere. Oh, I must read. I need wow. words. I certainly I felt I certainly felt that uh, around the start of July. After uh... we've made this joke every single part of a podcast, right? Come on, give it a rest. <laughs> we all know about the global pandemic. Wait, the what? <laughs> uh, right. Okay. On to the next topic. Uh, so this one I kept intentionally vague because I thought this would just be a bit of a discussion of the year in general. Um, but that is your favourite thing of 2020. <laughs> now, I I kind of frame this as your favourite online thing of 2020 <laughs> because, to be honest, everything I could think of that happened this year has been online. However, if it's not an online thing, you're, you're, welcome, to free, um, you're welcome to bring that up. Uh, and this is more like things that have... Events, uh, you know, or themes or something that happened this year. So to give you an example of what i mean uh my choice for 2020 and i don't know what i'm going to put for the image here because there's a there's a lot of potential uh my personal favorite thing of 2020 is the rise in popularity of vtubers <laughs> that's uh, funny because oh. i was thinking about saying that but <laughs> okay well suddenly this is going to be a very long episode oh. <laughs> we've got a lot to discuss lads. uh yeah so i mean i i'm not gonna i'm not gonna delve too deep into this obviously um but you know i mean the the last like two or three years vtubers have been a thing i mean tom i know you and i have discussed them back and forth the various ones kizuna i yeah, of course yeah. being the the sort of mother of all of them, basically. Um, and yeah, you know, they, they were always an interesting thing and sort of I I dive into it back and forth and kind of, you know, watch a bit of their playthroughs. And for the most part, they were Japanese. So it was kind of a good way for me to brush up on understanding Japanese a little bit because eventually I'd, I'd like be like, oh, I recognise that phrase. I know what she's saying. Um, but this year, I think majorly has uh, led to a, a bit of an uptick in especially English language uh, VTubers. So the, I, I yeah, think I mean I think it's partly due to the fact that maybe the technology for like motion capture or at least like head tracking has just like got there now. Um but it does seem the VTubers from like the start of the year until now have been popping up everywhere all of the time. And progressing very quickly within the year and growing like huge followings. As yes, well. so like the the start of the year, you know, we saw a few more. Um, I believe like middle, of, no, no, near the start of the year again. I think Hollow Live announced they had some English VTubers coming along, which is quite exciting. Um, and yeah, fast forward to the start of twenty twenty one, and quite a few of those are uh, they're nearing a million or past a million uh, subscribers on YouTube now, and well. I was just about to say, outside of Kizanu Ai, who has been going for years now, yeah. uh, VTubers have got pretty big, and actually the biggest VTuber outside of Kizanu Ai is Guagura. Oh, gosh, she's, she's a fish. she's an English VTuber, so yeah, it's the, uh, the rise, crazy. The rise to popularity has been meteoric. It is... It it really has gone from one of those kind of weird niches that people like, oh, okay, they, they look like anime characters and they're like playing games or making videos, that's kind of cute, to like suddenly, you know, seeing sort of major memes about the various, uh, you know, VTuber personalities. And of course, uh, th there is there is a favourite of the group, or at least 
Tim and I, anyway, I think uh, we can agree here. Uh, I'm I'm very very pleased to see that uh, a, a popular YouTuber who's now become a VTuber, uh, Nyanas, has really taken off and just hit a million really? subscribers on YouTube, I believe. So. Broccoli. Yeah, I think. I mean, Yana's been fantastic for years with her YouTube content, and it was just mm. such a natural fit for her to start being a VTuber. It made yes. a lot of sense. Well, and, I don't know. It's just a very wholesome, but also not wholesome community. <laughs> and it's just, I don't know, there's something very, very addictive about watching these, you know, cute anime girls play. Games. Yeah, I, I think. I don't know. It's, it's a strange phenomenon because it is. It just it's... attracts lots of different types of people, I think. Yeah, well, I, I've been thinking about this the last few days because I knew I was going to bring this up. So I was like, right, what can I talk about on this topic? And I've come to the conclusion I think the best way I could describe a VTuber to someone who has never watched any but, you know, has only heard the name or something is that it's kind of. The, it's a weird mishmash between a streamer, you know, who obviously has a personality and everything, and kind of like role playing as like an anime character or something, or just mm. or sort of like a weird mishmash between a streamer and an anime character. Mm. It's uh, mm. yeah, it, it's kind of engaging because they've all got themes. You're there for the personality, but the personality is a creation. The amount of fan content as well is ridiculous. Mm. Like, it's crazy how much engagement they have with the community. I think, like, pretty much every VTuber on Twitter is constantly sharing fan content. Yeah, I've it's, noticed uh, that. I follow a few, and uh, every, like, hour or two, I'll, uh, I'll you know, sort of, I'll, I'll check and scroll down the timeline. Yeah, as you said, it's just full of fan art, and it's really good fan art as well. Mm. It's uh, yeah, it, it's been an interesting. I think as you know, obviously, especially this year, we've all been a lot more online focused. But I think it was the perfect storm and the perfect birth of VTuber as a thing because mm. you know it is a streamer, but it's it's surreal and yeah, it uh... it is a little bit weird. It it is like interacting with an anime character in a sense. Honestly. Uh, God bless the riders of VTubers, and I hope they go from strength to strength. I want to welcome our new VTuber overlords. Absolutely. <laughs> and Red, and I... I was actually going to pick VTubers. And... Ah, okay, well... <laughs> and then, just as we started the podcast, I thought, oh, there's something else as well, so I'm going to... Okay, well, be, being as you've given a juicy lead in, Tom, you may as well yeah. follow it up oh, now. God. Right, Tom, what is right, your nomination? <laughs> Oh, What's God. your brief description of a nomination for brief. the best thing of 2020? <laughs> uh, well, um, so it's not of 2020, but I think it's something we've all definitely got into in 2020. So <laughs> Crying ourselves to sleep. It's going where I think it's going. It, it probably is, yeah. So uh, my choice, and something I may have referenced in an earlier podcast, is the comprehensive history of Chris Chan. <laughs> by Gino Samuel. Oh. Yeah, by Gino Absolutely. Samuel, who is a brilliant gent, to oh, be honest, what? for putting this time into this hours and hours and hours of content on possibly the most researched man since <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> You're not wrong. That's not the only comparison um, I've seen to Jesus Christ. But... <laughs> well, I mean, it's all covered to a head now, isn't it? Uh, the Jesus comparisons, I guess. Wow. But, um... So, Tom, well, give us when... give us a rundown. Yeah, give us a rundown of <laughs> what this series uh, is. Who is Chris Chan? For the viewers that don't know. <laughs> So, what, made him this way? <laughs> what keeps us interested? So Chris Chan has been an internet figure, something, someone you would call a lol cow. Um, that's the term that's been used, meaning that people like <laughs> basically keep encouraging Chris, or antagonizing chris yeah and just 
outcomes content really just absolute cringe face content so chris is this person who's to be honest had possibly the worst up upbringing i've ever seen yeah and... you watched the first episode of uh the so as far as Dan got it's just as far as i got and uh I know I have watched a few with you, like with on like a watch together kind of thing, and but uh, yeah, his up his upbringing was just really it, it really uh, tugged at my heartstrings because I was just like, oh my god, like you know it it was that bad. But uh, as uh, um, the the uh, series Fulton, as the series progressed, you kind of find oh he 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 makes decisions that. <laughs> Aunt, uh, the, also, know. the the first, the, well, the the second word in the title of the entire series, I think, sums it up incredibly well. Comprehensive. A very, yes. I, yeah. Uh, so, so no signs of slowing down. No, 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 no. I mean, there's so much more to go over. I mean, every episode weighs in. At an average of, would you say about forty minutes, guys? Yeah, forty minutes yeah. on the average. Yeah. Uh, I'm just checking now. Uh, there are forty-eight parts as of today. That's yeah, a lot of content. So some of them go over like an hour. Uh, and then others like uh, are about thirty minutes, but they're mostly about forty. But wow, wow. I, and the the fact that Gino Samuel goes over like every single social media post by Chris Chan, and like every single like personal ad on I don't know like Craigslist and stuff, hours and hours of audio footage recorded by trolls, it's crazy. It's and definitely honestly. It it's a little bit hard to recommend for everyone because I think. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, it's it, the it, nichest of niches. It's a yeah, it, of... it could definitely be seen as sort of like tedious to a point if you weren't mm. that interested. Yeah, um, yeah, definitely. However, but... uh, honestly, one thing I felt found about it was it felt almost like a really interesting, like diary entry kind of thing. Or oh, sort of mm. like a, a, a real deep look into someone's life because it's very rare. I mean, because Chris is such an open person, like, phenomenally open. Very open. I think it's incredibly rare that you see this deep, and, like, comprehensively, obviously, into someone else's life on such a small level. Because, like, honestly, it's looking at biographies and stuff, they are purely surface level in comparison to this. You will, you will watch, like, three episodes and know exactly what sort of... Chris's f eating food eating habits were at like a particular date in two thousand and eight or something. <laughs> it's insane. Yeah, I think we're all we're all Christorians here, <laughs> which uh, is the term for people uh, interested in Christory. <laughs> uh, oh God! <laughs> there are plenty of terms, and um, yeah, there's a whole lingo. There's like a million terms coming out of. Christian, uh, I'm not gonna go into them, but Jesus. Um, but anyway, it's yeah, like I agree with you, Red. It's kind of almost like Big Brother in a way. Um, yeah, the, the way we're looking into this person's life. Uh, it's far better though. Um, for the record, I do not condone any of the things that have happened to Chris. No. God, no. But... And like um, like I've mentioned through times when we watched it, sometimes the people who are trying to get a reaction out of Chris or Christine is are more cringy than Chris himself. Oh, yeah. So yeah. it really is a case of, you know, it's already happened, so we're watching the documentary of it, but it's 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 just cringy on both sides. Yes. I'm glad we got to talk about Chris Chen. As, as am I. I'm, I'm sure. Uh, and on a side note, Gino Samuel's music is is stellar as well. 
yeah oh yeah check him out absolutely Amazing i'll I'll leave a link musician. in the description below because uh genuinely a really interesting guy i think uh right who would like to nominate their best aspect of 2020 next okay uh yeah i don't know about best uh because this was like do you mean like things on on like web series or events so um rather than talk about uh tiger kin or things like that that's quite everybody knows about that um but i i think one of the the cool web series i watched is the uh castlevania series Ooh, yes okay. uh so yeah so th this uh, series is uh a faithful well i say faithful uh it's like it's based off castlevania 3 uh dracula's curse mm -hmm. and uh it's genuinely a really good animation uh and so good. It's I will say the first series because I remember watching it because that's the thing you you scroll around Netflix and sometimes you just you browse more than you actually watch I I, I find sometimes uh, and this just um, took me off guard uh, back in 2017 and um, but I find each season they just get better and better yeah. and like like season season three i was just like wow it, it's uh absolutely incredible series and i feel like they've um i i think season three was genuinely one of the best ones and it's uh so those not in the know it's uh about um trevor belmont who is the um he's the last of the belmont family and and so he's he, he's a monster hunter basically, and he and uh, he meets people along the way who fight uh, Dracula and demons. But it's just you, on the surface level, you it sounds a bit, oh, uh, you know, I've I've seen that before, yada yada. But uh, but the the story, um, the writing in it is uh, fantastic, and it, it's really. Uh, done well and i i liked it so much i i wanted to research uh that studio and there's uh so the people who make it uh it's a small studio uh called powerhouse animation studios hmm. and uh they, also this year they released uh blood of zeus which i watched and is incredible it's like a gory take on um the greek mythology and it's generally really good I, I absolutely love it and i've also found out recently that they're gonna be animating uh he-man masters of the universe ah, so cool. oh that's interesting yeah and and they've um apparently they've also announced another animated series based off uh the indian epic ramayana so uh ah, whether that'll right. come in but that's the thing these guys just um when i think of like any animations to recommend i'll say yep these guys you can't go wrong so i i'm generally so generally very excited um to see what they do next and hmm. i i'll i'll just recommend it uh this one as like best like web series um Tom, am yeah. I sorry? A bit of a tangent here. Am I right oh. in saying that the story of Hanuman, the Monkey King, uh, took place in the Ramayana? Because I think the Ramayana is not sure. Is the Ramayana is part of the Bhagavad Gita, isn't it? It is. Rather, I think not, the Bhagavad Gita is part of the. I. You know what? <laughs> it's been a while. I forgot. I. Now. I feel like Ramayana. I thought it was the other way round. No, 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 the Bhagavad Best. Gita is like the main text, I think. Uh, okay. Any any Hindus watching this, let me know in I... the comments below. Am I wrong about that? I feel like the story of Rama features Hanuman, right? That's uh... an incredible, just to say that's an incredible thing to adapt into an animated series. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I've said this for a while, but honestly, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of stories in the Bhagavad Gita that are really like out there and super trippy and stuff and it's like 
guys, please please adapt this. Make, make this into something. Especially so, animation. Yeah, that's the thing. And, uh, like, we, we talked about this um, uh, when we were talking about Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. Hmm. And uh, uh, Ridge was talking about, oh, wouldn't it be cool if the... Um, like, I know, Guardians of the Galaxy had, like, an animation that they could have done so much with that. And I feel like animation is, like, getting really good now. It's... it's hmm. uh, And that's the thing. Hmm. Uh, it's, it's, it's weird. Watching the, the, these kind of animation, I, I would wake up, and that'd be the first thing I'd watch in the morning. It'd be the equivalent of Saturday morning cartoons, but, like, for adults, basically. And it's it's fantastic. So... Um, uh, so again, the the uh, the animation studios is Powerhouse uh, Animation Studios, and uh, go check them out. I think the best thing, um, bringing it back to uh, Castlevania, the best thing with the Castlevania series, I think, is the voice cast. It's so good; yes. they get it like spot on. Richard Armitage is just perfect yeah. as Trevor. And I think in the third series as well, they got Bill Fucking Nye. Do voice yes. and oh, oh no. absolutely! I've fantastic. not seen season I could listen three. To yeah. Talk on, I could listen to talk about anything on repeat, Bill Nye. But he does yeah. such a great job. That character is just really, really interesting to watch and listen to. Yeah, yeah. I've seen all three series as well. And you're right, the third series was the best series. It just keeps getting like kind of weirder and weirder and like more off the off the charts. And it's just so good. Nice. Uh, right. So I believe Tim that leaves you to nominate your favorite thing of 2020 my thing is slightly related and i mean very slightly because speaking of the belmonts um they're actually in this um really good video game called smash bros hey. and my favorite hey. moment of 2020 by far has been sephiroth's reveal for smash bros <laughs> yes absolutely <laughs> fantastic I, I, it's just one of those things where it was so unexpected because mm. everyone was guessing you know oh, it's going to be sora oh, it's going to be crash oh and they got all the duma picks it's going to be another fire emblem character it's going to be gino from mario rpg just... <laughs> sorry gino fans <laughs> sorry, gino fans. I'm, I'm sorry but then yeah everyone's watching the game awards and it's one of those things where anyone who remotely knows the franchise you're watching you're watching the reveal and I just love Smash Bros. Reveals trailers in general. They're like one of the most hype things ever. And you're watching it. And the, the best thing about it is that you can tell who it's going to be before you even see him. Because you're the first notes of One Winged Angel playing. <sighs> and it's just like, what the f It was just so out of left field for them to pick Sephiroth of all people. And I, I mean, it's just such a good choice. Like, even I, people who haven't really played Final Fantasy VII got hyped because hmm. he's just such an over-the-top fucking yeah, ridiculous yeah. character to pick. And it just brought excellent music, and I, it was just a hype moment, the 2020 that we needed. I generally thought Mario was going to die. <laughs> that... <laughs> like, the closeness in the animation of that reveal trailer to the movie Advent Children of Final yes. Fantasy VII Oh, it's shockingly accurate to the, the source material. The fact, like... the fact that the reveal trailer was a love letter, not only to Sephiroth, obviously, but to Advent Children, a film that's, what, like 13 years old by this point or something? Yeah. Yeah, like, literally, a love letter, like you said. It's just the amount of references and the phrases, like, the, the things that he said, like, shall I give Smash Despair? It's so oh. good. And it just felt like it was kind of like a surreal moment. Like, what? The Sephiroth got in? What? And then looking, looking, looking at it now as, as you know, uh, Smash as a whole now, uh, it kind of makes sense having Cloud, having you know, Cloud and um, Sephiroth in. So yeah, it is because every game that Cloud goes to, Sephiroth ends up going to. Cloud got in yeah. Kingdom Hearts. Sephiroth goes over the Kingdom Hearts. Cloud gets in, you know, obscure fighting game <laughs> for egg, or egg guys or however you pronounce it. Oh, Sephiroth's yes. in it to fight him. Cloud gets in Dissidia. Sephiroth's in Dissidia. It, it just always happens. It's also, inevitable. the fact that Sephiroth is genuinely a really good character in Smash. Holy shit, oh, he's one of the best ones. OP, yeah. So fun to play as. He's just got so much things ah. to mess around with and different types of attacks. It's just yeah, absolutely. He's he's was, a monster. 
I was just going to say as well, you were talking about Smash reveals. They're like kind of unique in a way, aren't they? The way everyone watches hmm. what characters Absolutely. coming out next and that collective guesswork before. Yeah. Uh, it really ups the hype because we found out that it was going to be Sephiroth the same time everyone else did. Yeah. You know, so it's, it, it's a nice special about a Smash reveal and yeah. Sephiroth. Oh my god! It it's an event. I think it's sort of mm. it, it's it's very rare because sort of I mean, I follow the fighting game community and you know you, you get a lot of like hints and reveals and teases and stuff for those games, and they kind of they get a bit of traction you know like Dragon Ball Fighter Z, that's had a bit of hype around it, but like nothing compares to Smash. There are game reveal trailers that aren't as talked about as a Smash character reveal trailer. It's crazy. They literally. They literally fill rooms, don't they? Like, yeah. um, there's that famous video, you know, where they say everyone is here. Ah, uh, uh, like it's... Before Smash came out, and they'd, like, rented rooms so people could go and watch it together. I think one of them was in the New York Nintendo store. I think there was, like, an event yeah. or something. But, yeah, it's... I think that's the one, yeah. It's, uh, but, yeah. Wow, that, well, that, that's been a variety of events as well, I think. that's See... That summed up why twenty twenty was an old doom and gloom. But no the internet saves us. But no, as always. Uh high tech, low life. That's the future, lads. Uh but no, it's time to look forward to that bleak, miserable cloud in the sky we call twenty twenty one. Can it get worse? Maybe. But there is there is a little bit of light over there. And what is that light? <clears throat> That's right, it's time to discuss. The things we're looking forward, or the thing we're looking forward to, in twenty twenty one. So I'll be honest with you guys. So th- this is a this is a um, recommendation by Tom. Uh, I I hadn't thought of this, so kudos Tom, because this does kind of weigh into the last uh, thing. I struggled for a few days, and so my pick is going to be very small, and there's not going to be much to talk about. Um, <laughs> I mean, that may be the way of all of it, to be fair, because it's just speculation at this point. Is it your birthday, right? Is it just your birthday? <laughs> oh, man, I wish. Uh, <laughs> no, the thing I'm look- most looking forward to in 2021, and to be honest, one of the only things I can think of that I know of that's happening in 2021, and n- none of you are going to know about this, so it's going to be really quick, is... Hey, we might be surprised. Okay, maybe. Is the Digimon Vital Bracelet... Uh, so basically, I've got a picture on screen here, as you can probably see. It's uh, the combination of a Dig- Digimon Virtual Pet, uh, which I bought last year for the first time. They like re-released the original ones. It's a lot of fun. But they've in- they've um, combined it with the Fitbit, basically. Yo. Which, which means that basically, it's kind of a bit like a Poker Walker from Heart, Gold and Soul Silver. Except, obviously, it's got a few more features. But yeah, it's basically, it's a virtual pet, but... You can train it and power her up by, with steps and stuff. And being as quite, I'm quite an avid walker, I like going on really big walks and stuff. I thought, oh, this is this is perfect. I'm really excited for this now. I've got like a virtual pet and you know a reason to go for long walks and stuff. So, so it's like a cross between a Tamagotchi and a Fitbit, basically. Yeah, basically it's it's a Fitbit, but you've got a virtual pet on it that you can like feed and power up with your steps and stuff. Uh, oh. Although I was disappointed, I went to check today and all the pre-orders are closed. Uh, oh. it, it comes out in March, though, so I'll just snag one in March. I don't think they're going to be sold out forever. But, well. uh, but yeah, that that should be pretty cool, I think. And it just looks like a regular Fitbit, so I can wear it around and no one's going to be like, what's that Digimon thing on your wrist? Because it just looks like a you know thing everyone else has. Do you mind me asking then, Ray? Because of course. to be honest, I'm quite into Digimon. Uh, <laughs> Digimon's <laughs> bloody great. Yes. Um, I was going to ask basically, like, how many Digimon can you get? I imagine they're going to digivolve. So yeah, so from rookies or babies. So they've got an decide. interesting system. So basically, the the, the uh, v- vital bracelet itself isn't that expensive. It's like thirty pounds or something. Uh, yeah. So basically, you get it's a new Digimon. I. It's called something like Vitamon or something. So yeah. you get him and his egg group. But what's kind of cool, and maybe I don't know how you guys feel about this, 
there are additional Digimon expansions they're doing where there's a small slot with like a micro SD card kind of thing. And you can buy character expansion chips. So basically you slide it in and oh. it adds like a few new Digimon. And I think basically it's their way of like, instead of releasing a new one at the end of the year and then one next year, they can just be like, okay, we're just going to make character chips for the next couple of years and you can buy your favourite one. So when they announce the Terriamon, Terriamon one, I am pre-ordering that shit. I love Terriamon. He's best Digimon. Oh, that that's really on theme, actually. I think, uh, yeah. because obviously Digimon's all about data and Yeah, and technology. I think the character cards look, they look, I think they look like a micro, uh, micro SD card, but I don't think they are, obviously. But yeah, they basically look like a chip. You like swipe into your oh. watch and it's like, yeah, that's Digimon. Yeah, boy. Can you, can you have battles with them? With other people, uh, I is think that so. An option? Yeah, I, I think. Oh, that, no, this is interesting me now. Yeah. Um. So it's only releasing in Japan at the moment, but that doesn't matter because, I mean, the w- worst that'll happen is their names are in Kana, but you you can translate that easy. So. Yeah, oh, I'm looking forward to that. That's actually quite exciting. Yeah. So there we are. Uh. Right. Uh, Let Let's follow the theme then. Tom, do you want to go next? Right, so uh, mine's actually quite imminent, and <laughs> imminent owl. <laughs> I've actually caved. Uh, I Uh-oh. said I won't. I wouldn't never use the Epic Games Store, oh, but no. I'm going to cave. Uh, so Uh-oh. my thing I'm most looking forward to, which is out on, I think it was the twentieth. Yeah, it's out on the twentieth of this month. Is Hitman free? Okay. Um, oh, Hitman P. <laughs> <laughs> so, funnily enough, um, if I were to put second place for game that I enjoyed this year, hmm. uh, I put EU four first, but I would put Hitman two as ah. my number two, and I've actually put uh, just under a hundred hours into it. Damn. Okay. So, so basically, uh, just to go into it a bit briefly, uh, uh, the Hitman series, they decided to reboot uh, a good while ago. And at first they were doing this episodic thing. Uh, Square Enix originally uh, were releasing them, if I remember rightly, but these days they're actually independent, completely independent. Um, so every game now they've been releasing, every expansion content, it adds to the next game. So Hitman 3 is going to have all the content from the previous games wow. upscaled and made better, basically, like they did with Hitman 2. And the progression you have made in Hitman 2 is actually going to carry over. So my level and all my items. Um, In terms of a sandbox, it's absolutely fantastic. So uh, just to give you an idea from the second game... There's so many ways to kill someone in like a diff- your assassination target, and with the unlocks, it just gets even better. Um, the story is, yeah, it's nothing much, uh, but that's not what you want. You want that sandbox where you can assassinate these targets in various different ways, and honestly. The third game now, with all the culminative stuff that's already been being added, it's very exciting. I'm looking forward to the levels they're going to add next. Um, I haven't, to be honest, I haven't spoiled myself too much on it. All I know so far, and I know there's been more revealed, there's going to be a level based in, um, I think it's actually in the world's tallest building in Dubai. Ah, oh, Burj, Burj Khalifa? Um, I think it's in the Burj Khalifa, or it could be like an approximation in the game. Ah, yeah. But it's going to be atop that. And Ooh. another level, which is very back to its roots, is kind of a who done it in a um mm. in like an old mansion. I think it's in England actually. And uh obviously that's like absolute classic, but they're uh, bringing that to this trilogy for the first time. Yeah, uh, I saw the I, I saw the trailer else for that. beyond that. Yeah, um, 
getting some the real as nice well, out. Like huge. Absolutely huge levels. Sorry, Dan, go on. Yeah, again, some real Knives Out uh, vibes from that trailer uh, that they brought out for the um, the England location. So, yeah, no, I um, I can vouch. Uh, I played the Hitman series a long time since mm. 2006. So, um, and I picked up the series last year, and yeah, yeah, it's, it's fantastic. And I'm going to wait for Hitman three until it gets a bit cheaper but uh um yeah mm. uh and while i'm talking i'll go on about what i'm really looking forward to uh yeah. if it comes out in 2021 and that is cyberpunk 2077 yeah, uh, yeah no i'm uh that, i mean uh, that is a thing i i i played it um last month and on i ps4 because uh on PS4, to so uh, on on base model PS4 as well. So it's yes, it, of it's the early access version. Yeah, it's the bad version yeah. you've heard of, basically. Uh, unfortunately, yeah. No, it's uh, yeah. I mean, I don't want to go too much of it, but yeah, I'm I'm wait I'm waiting till February for that. So understandable. Um, on a positive but, note, though, what are you looking forward to in 2021? Elden Ring. If it comes out, <laughs> that's oh. optimistic. That's that very optimistic. optimistic. I'm looking forward to discussing this at the end of uh, December 2021. We're in like, what are you looking forward to next year, Dan? My dis- my nomination is Elden Ring. And oh, we'll have the same reaction. <laughs> very optimistic for 2022. Oh yeah. I think the funniest thing about Elden Ring is you go into like every games thing. Like for example, we were watching the Game Awards, and it was a bit of a meme like oh give us Elden Ring give us Elden Ring and obviously you didn't get it I think even Jeff Keighley mentioned it uh on the on the stream so yeah. so I reckon very optimistic I reckon no Dan uh you should tell us so far what do we know about Elden Ring well thanks for that Dan right now on to next one <laughs> It's become a running joke. Hey, no, really. look, yeah, we I mean, know. I think it'll be worth it. We know I it's think a game because George R. R. Martin is involved, and, and yes, he's very, every, you know, everybody is waiting on winds of winter. Jesus Christ, George, yes. just get it, get it yes. released. Things I'm looking forward to in 2021: winds of winter. Oh my, yeah. <laughs> I don't know which one's more unrealistic: winds of winter or I. Wind. I'm gonna say Elden Ring because I think at least they at least it's working with the game studio, which kind of generally tends to have a time frame. Whereas Winter Winter, I I don't know when George feels like yeah. Yeah, well, I mean when it's released, I don't even know if books are still gonna be a sort of format anymore. So yeah, I'm but, worried uh, it's yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say I'm worried it's gonna become the next The Last Guardian. Uh, to be all this oh. with you. Well, hey, to be fair, we know that it's a game. Uh, it's been written by George R. R. Martin. It's been made by From Software. Right, Basically, so, Tim, uh, your no, nominee. A, well, no, what, the, what we know about it so far is that it's going to be a, a bit more open world. Uh, you're going to have a return to um, customising your own character unlike in Sekiro where it was like more hmm. of a narrative yeah um hmm. um and uh, apparently <laughs> that one of the big things um that I've heard of is you're going to have mounted uh horseback so you'd be hmm. able to uh fight on on horseback um and uh, again there's uh, something what, what I like about if it watched, I watched the trailer back in 2019. I know, uh, but it was very. They didn't give much away. They they didn't give. Much I feel away like that's been charitable. Yes, and um, supposedly George R. R. Martin has done it. The, oh, okay. Oh, he's completed so, it. Yeah. I mean, to be it, fair, I know, I know, I know. We make make fun of it. I think there is. The, I'd say there's like a strong fifty fifty. Like well, fifty percent chance I reckon of it coming out this year. 
but like it's if so they're being they're doing a very interesting marketing thing where they're gonna know like they're gonna show it off a couple months before release which well that's the thing i think maybe. right they're if uh, well we have to quickly talk about cyberpunk because they hyped up that game for so long uh, for yeah. so long and everyone was thinking it was going to be the next big thing you know and i think uh, ultimately that was kind of their downfall and you know i could i could talk another hour about cyberpunk but uh, for a bit given of... that we're here good thing so my my bet is that the i mean from software kind of doing an opposite thing where i would disagree out... there dan okay i think they're doing exactly the same because especially in the early days of cyberpunk there was bugger all mm. that we knew about it yeah there yeah. was one trailer and then there was years of nothing mm. and then there was maybe something else small like but I it was feel like they're doing the same i think no no the big problem is was i think with I mean, obviously, pre-orders aren't up, but they encourage people to pre-order, uh, and I think the and after after Cyberpunk, I think I've I'm not going to pre-order, um, <laughs> uh, because it's I I think it, it's because I used to I used to pre-order quite a bit, and then I then I realized oh no I'll I'll do it for only games that I definitely know are gonna be. Uh, pretty good and working when i get it and so i've kind of learned i think red you you don't really uh because i i think i talked to you about this you we, you don't really pre-order no really uh, well yeah my, my my whole stance on pre-ordering now has kind of developed into i'll only pre-order a game if a i know i'm gonna play it like fairly soon and b i think that it's either niche or like specific enough of a game that it needs the support of as many people going like yo yo make some more of those i mean a prime I example the kingdom hearts rhythm game we mentioned last episode mm. i pre-ordered that in a heartbeat because uh tim will attest the theater rhythm series is something that i really want to return like you know you're I, gonna yeah. get a good game as well there's no way yeah you're gonna so i i, I pre I pre-ordered it with like knowledge like look I know I'm going to play this straight away and also I just want it as a kind of way of going like hey developers make more of these please make more of these I will give you money before I've even played the game just <laughs> just do this I feel I feel with some games like you're saying there's like you know an expectation it's going to land in a certain place hmm. while some games are the unknown like Cyberpunk for example with yeah. uh, Pokemon like the Pokemon series it might be a weaker game than the last one, hmm. but you know what you're going to get, ultimately. Yeah, exactly. And it's not going to fall very much outside of the parameter you're expecting, so... Hmm. I think yeah. Nintendo are on another ball game, though. They, you know... Because um, the amount of games that Nintendo put out that... It's weird, because I... Um, I think I said this ages ago. Like honestly, most of the games I play are on either PC or co console. But if you were to tell me, oh, which one's your favorite uh, console? I'd probably say Nintendo Switch. Yeah, hundred percent. Because yeah. the amount of good games you get on the Switch are there. Are, there are more good games on the Switch, and then then uh, I'd say the Nintendo Switch is probably their best output in years hmm. oh yeah um, yeah so uh, yeah but... so um so yeah that, that's what i say uh, um about elden Ring. fingers crossed it comes <laughs> out in 2021 but otherwise uh i probably i think there's going to be another castlevania series if uh, if it comes maybe. out this year maybe but that's nice. yeah right i think that just leaves us with tim then what are you most looking forward to in 2021 Seeing my family. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, yes. I mean, you know, that's 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 one part of it. But yeah. something I am looking forward to. Um, I kind of touched on it last time, so, so sorry for boring people. Um, but I'm really looking forward to um the new um, Marvel series 
Um, oh, yes. I want to see One Division really. One Division just looks really out there, and I really like the direction that they go in with the MCU and kind of mm. go in like, yeah, screw it, multiverse, let's let's go with it. It looks, I don't know, it just looks a lot more interesting than like the first few waves of Marvel where it was like, these are heroes, yeah, we know. And now it's I, just it... going to be a bit more weird and wacky, and it, I'm just quite excited for where it's going. Not, yeah. not, not really looking forward too much to Black Widow, I'm sure that'll be a movie as well. But, um, yeah. Hmm. But Eternals I, looks good. Uh, I'm yeah. That as well. I think, um, you know, because they, I mean, they kind of ventured into TV series with like Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Well, they've done TV series before. Well, I mean, ten, not, not really them, but, um, you know, Daredevil and Jessica Jones yeah. and stuff, which oh, yeah, were yeah. a big old mix bag of really good and really fucking oh, boring. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, so... hopefully, we'll do a Marvel episode, actually. I'd, I'd quite like to do. Oh yes. Uh, oh well, several to be honest, because we we could we we could go through a lot there. Um, but yeah, no, it's. I think, I I think going as you said, the multiverse route is the best and most interesting thing now because, especially after Endgame, it's hard to top it in terms of scale and stuff. So you know, so just go crazy. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. Cool idea. I'm really up for it. Yeah, I mean. On top of that, you got uh, all these sort of new Star Wars series as well. So Disney yes. Plus is actually kind of, you know, you know, almost I'm worth getting... playing at this point. Yeah, yeah. almost. Well, almost. It, I'd um, say it has I'm potential very... because whilst they've announced a lot of these things, it's it well, it's it's hard to tell. It it, it basically mm. it does feel a little bit like when Netflix announced. It's gonna be four Marvel TV series, and everyone's like, "Okay, okay, this is good. This is gonna be great." Iron Fist, yeah, I'll watch Iron Fist, and then people watch the first episode. So, uh, you know, it's... <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> but again, we we'll we'll get into that in the specifically Marvel episode I'd like to do. But uh... so, j- just give us a very quick breakdown, Tim. What's the setup for One Division for those that don't know? I mean, there's not much of a setup. The setup is uh, Scarlet Witch looks like she's gone a bit cray cray. Oh, um, yes. You know, apparently Vision is still alive, and um, they're they're in a sitcom, but it's not a sitcom, and um, God knows where it's going to go. On it, that's what I'm really excited about. We, we we don't still don't really know that much about it. I I'm kind of excited for House of M potential thing, which was a uh, X Men series in like the mid two thousands. The I think only th- they're gonna do like a variant of that. I the think only- they kind of take elements from it. Yeah, I mean, I, it's definitely gonna be similar. But the only thing, um, I think won't work for it because I, I was thinking about this. What made House of M interesting, uh, was the, it was a switch up basically. It was an alternate reality created by Scarlet Witch, where mutants were the majority and non mutants were the minority and like outcasts and stuff. But the in the MCU, like. Mutants aren't particularly treated that badly or weirdly. It's sort of, it seems they're kind of just there, and people are like, oh, they're either heroes or they're scary. Well, they haven't, they haven't really touched on mutants at all, have they? Really? No. So because of the whole X Men debacle. But, I mean, know, that's I, out of the way now, but it's too late to set up like a mutant storyline now, isn't it? Yeah, I, 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 I could see it going to some really interesting what if scenarios, though. Oh, that'll be cool. It's another thing I'll be looking forward to. They're doing that What If series, aren't oh, they? Ah, yes. That looks really, really fucking cool as well. Yeah. I, um... Right. Well, I, I think, unless anything, anyone has any last zingers to throw in, I think that wraps up um, our three-part, like, launch episode of Talk Toys. Uh, so... Thank you very much for sitting through this. I must. It must come to about three hours worth of podcasts now. We went through a lot. We did. We went through a lot. We have, but you know, it's it's been a nice wrap up, and I think a nice launch to this series. So, um, one thing I'm looking forward to in 2021 is the upcoming Talk Toys episodes. Ah, oh, do, do you see how smooth that segue was? Ah, oh, like butter. Um, yeah, so th- this this upcoming year, obviously, I've got a lot of plans for Talk Toys. 
a uh, lot of themes hopefully a lot of interesting topics and stuff it's not going to be as regular as these three episodes i kind of got them out within the space of a week of each other basically because you know it, no one really wants to hear about the 2020 wrap-up sort of mid-march or something but you know i i've got a couple ideas um and i'll be having some guests on some of you guys obviously maybe some other people um i don't know it'll, it'll be a, a very range. specific episode of of draw toys that you've been promising for maybe a very long time, maybe Red. there'll be a draw toys episode mm. in the works mm. maybe it'll be Ooh, all you, about uh, flowers uh, wait no oh. what oh okay um but yeah well uh but keep an eye out for that there's 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 no time frame i don't know when they'll be when when they'll be made but they, they will be in 2021 hopefully unless something tragic happens so on that cheery note thank you very much for watching and thank you very much for joining me guys it's been a lot of fun um and yeah that about wraps up the episode so uh it's goodbye from me it's goodbye from me it, it's goodbye from tom it's goodbye from tim and it's goodbye from talk toys as a separate entity because it's <laughs> It's, it's it's become it's goodbye from the talk toys. Yeah, he's become bigger than us now. He's in charge. It's talk toys' world. We're just living in it. Goodbye.